Good evening, everyone, those who are here with us physically and also those who are joining us on the internet. Tonight, we are continuing with our exploration of the, the development of the cosmos and the human being. And uh, tonight, we are going to explore the evolution of the human divine spark, the human monad and its vehicle of expression, which is us, what we call human beings. So in the theosophical approach, the idea of evolution is more complex than the, the scientific view, because the scientific view covers only the physical evolution of human beings and of the universe as such. In theosophy, it is said that evolution goes on at on three different levels, not only on the physical plane, but also on an intellectual plane and on a spiritual plane. So we can divide or, or classify the different aspects of a human being in three general principles that are familiar to our Western tradition that would be what we can call spirit. This in theosophy is called the monad. This is the divine spark. Then we have the soul, which in theosophy is uh, technically called the higher ego. The idea of the word ego is in the in the original sense, sim simply as a center of I-ness, which can be spiritual or personal um, according to the level that it is expressing. The idea is that at the level of the soul, that's the highest or the purest expression of our sense of I-ness. And then we have the body. So all these three principles are undergoing a particular evolution. As we said, the spiritual evolution, this is what Blavatsky calls intellectual evolution, which by intellectual, she's not referring to the, the mind as we know it. You know, when we talk about something that is intellectual, we say it belongs to our th normal thinking. The word intellect is used also as it was used by the Greeks, which is related to the soul, uh, to the nous in, in Greek philosophy. And then the physical evolution, that is the evolution that the body undergoes. Now, all these three levels of evolution are aided or helped by different celestial beings. We have seen in our last talk that there are such a, in the theosophical view, there are such a thing as a, a hierarchy of celestial beings. They are on different planes and they have different roles in the universe. So each one of these levels are, as I said, aided by the action of different orders of celestial beings. So let us see a little what the, the, this structure of celestial beings is, and then we will see how they are acting to help the evolution of the different aspects of the human being. So we have, let us start by the, the manifested logos, which is triple as we saw in, in the previous talks. This is, could be compared to a, to a certain extent with the Trinity in all different traditions. Although this, in the theosophical view, the manifested logos is not so personal, so an anthropomorphic as it is usually in other traditions. Now, from this manifested logos, it is said that there are 
seven rays coming forth. One, no, let us put it on the other side. Seven. Um, these are the seven primordial rays of consciousness. The idea is that the monads, they belong to one of these rays. The, the idea of rays is complex in itself, but these are like seven different modes of consciousness. So the monads that belong to these rays will tend to have a certain or express a certain aspect of the universe in a more marked way than the others. So for example, the first ray is related to the quality that we call will, willpower. So a person that is strongly influenced by the first ray is a person that has a lot of willpower, that the ways that that person relates to the world is through willpower. There are also traditions that fall into this category. For example, the Raja Yoga is said to be part of this kind of approach, an approach where through willpower we try to uh, dominate the lower nature. The second ray is related to wisdom, for example. So you, ha you have some other traditions that are based on wisdom, on trying to perceive what is truth. And uh, we have different qualities for each one of the rays. So it is said that the monads, they have like a, an essential quality. Now, as the monads go down into the different planes, of course, they acquire many different qualities. Uh, but essentially, there is like a, a background quality that is coloring whatever other thing the monad acquires. So these seven rays are sometimes called the, the seven logoi, or planetary logo, logoi, or in the secret doctrine they are called ahis, uh, or dhyani buddhas. There are several different names for this. Now, out of these seven, it is said that there are 12 other hierarchies. Twelve other hierarchies. Uh, uh, for example, these seven, seven uh, logoi are related to the seven sacred, sacred planets in astrology. It is said that the planets could be seen as their bodies. These are influences that are pervading the solar system. And um, each one of these logoi has a particular influence on a particular planet, but then also on the whole, whole system. Now, these 12 hierarchies are related to the 12 signs of the uh, zodiac. So the idea is that the logoi work with their influence through the different hierarchies. So you can see how this system is the basis of astrology. Now, out of these 12 hierarchies, it is said that five of them, uh, the, the, the role of five of them is already ended. So they are out of the system. They, they were working on the creation of the universe, so to say. And at this point, they are not active anymore. They have passed on to higher planes. So out of these 12, we have seven that are still active in our system. And these seven hierarchies are involved in the evolution of the, the solar system. So it is said that the first, second, and third hierarchy are formless. These are the, the more spiritual or the higher hierarchies, and we can know very little about them. What we know is that they help the monad in their, spirit, in their spiritual evolution. We are going to see that later. Then there is the fourth hierarchy, which is said to be the, the human monads. These human monads right now, they are building the, what we call the human being, and they are developing 
the, their awareness. And at the end of the process of human evolution, they will become part of the celestial beings, part of the dhyanis, as it is called in theosophy. But right now, the monads, as any, any other hierarchy, they are evolving. All these hierarchies, re remember that we, what they are, they are doing, they are still evolving. Now, the fifth and the sixth hierarchy, these are called the, in, in Hinduism, asuras. And the Sikhs are called, for example, they have different names, but Anikshwatas. These two hierarchies have to do with the intellectual evolution of the monads. And then finally, we have the seventh hierarchy, which in Hinduism, they are called Barhishats. And they have to do with the physical evolution of the monad. So, Barhishats. Can I uh, stop you for a second? Yes. Hang on. Why do you call them uh, hierarchies? Hierarchies are usually, you know, uh, president, so the vice president. Mm -hmm. you know. Yes, because that, that's a good question. Because all of them, they go through the different planes. Suppose if we, if we have the planes in this way, they go through all the different planes and manifest on the different planes in different ways. So when we talk about the, the Agnishvatas, they really manifest on different planes. Um, we usually, in the secret doctrine, what, what we are concerned with is how these Agnishvatas are affecting the human evolution on the human plane, so to say. But we have, uh, Blavatsky sometimes would, would use the Gnostic view, especially the Gnostic, the very early Gnostic view of three levels of emanations, what they call sizigis. Uh, uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it well uh, right in English. They are like the eons, the, these angels that are first emanated from the fire, which is the, the, the deity. And there is a first level of deities. Then these deities emanate a second level of deities, which are Re, they resemble the first one, but they are a little more limited. And this one emanates a third one. So they have the physical world, an intermediate world, and then the spiritual world in, in the Gnostic system. But all of them, they follow, they belong to a same category. You know, in, in Gnosticism, they are named as virtues, different virtues that belong to, to the deities. So that virtue emanates on the different planes, and that constitutes the hierarchy. So the hierarchy is um, um, like coming down on the planes. For example, the, the Barhishats, within the Barhishats, you have the, the heads of the hierarchies, and then you have all the lower devas and nature spirits and elementals, they all belong to the seventh hierarchy. And the Barhishats are like the heads of them. And Blavatsky says that the, the idea of the, the hierarchy is really complex. And she just gave you know, a, a, a simple idea. But in India, they have like 33 million of gods, which resembles a little you know, the diversity diversity of the hierarchies. So these are the seven out of the 12 that are active in the evolution of the monad on the different levels. And now we are going to see how they interact and help the evolution of the monad. So the idea in theosophy is, as probably most of you are familiar, that evolution has two movement, one in which the spirit goes deeper into matter. And then 
another movement in which the spirit goes back to the high plane that it was at the beginning of the journey. The first three hierarchies that help with the spiritual evolution of the monad, what they do is helping the monad to descend into matter. The monad we are talking about, you know, when we have the, the seven planes of the universe, we have Atman, which is the, if we count from above, is the third plane, you know, in the, in this particular view that I'm using, there are two divine planes which belong to the Logos. They are called Adi and Anupadaka. We already saw this in, in, I think, the first of these talks. Then on the third plane, we have Adman. Now, the monads that we are talking about in this particular case are like the root that is going to manifest on the Admic and Buddhic level. You know, sometimes we call the monad Atma Buri, but this is really the manifestation of the monad that is above these planes of Atma Buri. So th this is just for those who, who have in mind the, the concept of the, these different planes. Otherwise, the idea is that these monads, these divine seeds at the beginning, they are completely unconscious in the lower planes. On the higher planes, they, they are one with everything. And on the lower planes, they are completely unconscious because they are not differentiated enough. So these hierarchies, the three first hierarchies, what they do is to awaken the, the potentialities in the monad, and it helps the monad to express them outside, to be to begin to express them. It's like if when we are, if we are uh, sleeping, we have a lot of potentialities, but we are asleep. Somebody wakes us up, and then we start using our faculties. So we could use that metaphor. The monads are like asleep, and these three first formless hierarchies help the monad to awake the awaken the potentialities that are in there. And the monad begin to vivify the, the matter that they are going to use as a vehicle of expression. So in theosophy, it is said that there are seven kingdoms. Four of them we know, mineral, plants, animals, and human beings. But three of them are unseen. They are called elemental kingdoms. So let us put. They are called elemental because it's a very, a very elemental form of consciousness. They are forces more than entities. But the monad begins to vivify the matter of the planes, and that life is what produces what we call the elemental kingdoms. So there are three elemental kingdoms going down into matter. We don't need to stop too much into these kingdoms. But eventually, the monad reaches the, the point of the mineral kingdom, in which the monad is completely encased in matter. Of course, when we talk that the monad is encased in matter, there, we have to keep in mind always that the idea is that the monad is always transcendent but it's also immanent. So the immanent aspect of the monad is encased in the mineral kingdom. You know that some sensitives, they can perceive a, a certain consciousness in crystals or rocks or stones. That consciousness is a consciousness of the monad expressing through the mineral kingdom. Now, of course, that consciousness is very simple, very elemental. And as the, the physical vehicle of consciousness becomes more complex, then that consciousness also becomes more complex. But in this first part of the, the evolutionary, evolutionary journey, the monad basically descends into matter and begins to 
um, vivify the matter that is going to use for evolution. Then in the second part, the idea is to begin to be aware of the environment. So for example, it is said that the second part, we have the vegetable, then we, we have the animals, and then we have the human beings. In this part of the evolutionary journey, what begins to operate is the physical evolution. For the physical evolution, the seventh hierarchy, the one of the Barhishats and all the, spirit, the nature spirits, are actively helping. So what they are trying to do is, from the mineral, to begin to create more and more complex forms through the vegetables, through animals, and eventually through human beings, so that the monad can really express through these forms. So we can see how the consciousness in a vegetable is much more alive than that in the, in the mineral. It is not so much because the monad is different, but because the organism allows the monad to express more of its consciousness. Then we go to animals, which are much more aware of the environment than the vegetables. And finally, we reach the human beings. During the first stage of evolution, in the evolution of human beings, uh, you know, in the theosophical view, there are these seven root races that are called. They are different evolutionary cycles where little by little the human form is developed. At the beginning, it is a, a very etheric or, or not too physical form. And little by little, this form begins to become denser and more physical as we know it now. So during the first stage of human beings, we can say here we have again this this uh, scheme of human evolution, and let us call the different stages root races. By races, we don't mean ethnicity, we, means, we mean evolutionary cycles. We are, the whole humanity is right now in the fifth evolutionary cycle or root race. But by midway in the third, root race, something happens. Because the monad had been immersing into, into matter, but it cannot go deeper than the first two planes. You know, I, maybe I should mention again, the idea is that we have seven planes. The first two are divine, and then we have five. Out of those five, the first two are what are called Atma and Buri. The monad cannot go lower than booty. Then we have the physical evolution that is growing, and it grows from the physical plane, which is at the bottom, to the astral plane, that is the one that follows the, the physical. But then we have a gap, because there is a third plane in between this. Yeah, or maybe I can. Well, this thing uh, about the evolution, I think, let me show with the, the planes. So, so we have these two planes that are logoic. They are divine planes, more for the, the evolution of the, the spiritual aspect of the universe. Then we have here Adma. Buddhi, Manas, which is the mind, then the astral plane, and then the physical. We saw this in the first, the, the first talk in the series. So the monad can come to these two planes. 
and the physical evolution with animals and the, the primitive human being, they develop a physical body and an emotional body. But there is a gap in which the monad cannot communicate really to the physical and the emotional because there is this gap in between. The problem is that nature cannot develop a mind by itself in the animal or the primitive human being. You know, I mentioned this, that Wallace, who was one of the, the co-discoverer -disco of the theory of evolution, along with Darwin, he said, there are some things that cannot be explained by a regular growth in evolution. One of them was the acquirement of mind in human beings, from animals to human beings. He said, um, I don't see how nature can develop the mind. There is an, an extra factor there, something that, that has to, be, to happen in addition to the, the physical evolution. And that is exactly what the esoteric philosophy says. It says that the physical evolution, all it can do is to get up to here, and the spiritual evolution can come up to here. So now comes the third stage or, or, or aspect of evolution, that is the intellectual evolution. These two hierarchies, the fifth and the sixth hierarchy, they help humanity to awaken the mind, and they, they help the monad to take possession of the mental plane. The, this gives origin to what we call the higher ego, the soul, the human soul. So far we had spirit and we had body, but there was no soul. So these two hierarchies help to form the human ego in which the monad can begin, begin to express. And uh, this higher ego is the one that now will be the proxy of the monad on the lower planes, because this higher ego will take possession of the body and the emotions and form what we call a human being. So once we get, I was saying, to halfway of the third root race, this hierarchy of beings, which are called sometimes with a generic name, the Manasa Putras, it means the sons of the mind. Manasa means mind, Putra is son. So these hierarchies, which are the sons of the, the universal mind, help awakening the mind that was latent in humanity. And then human being is complete. It has a spirit, a soul, and a body. So before we go into the human evolution itself, let's see if there is any comment or question. OK, the first question goes back to when you talked about the zodiac signs. Mm -hmm. So what signs of the zodiac are associated with each of the hierarchies? Um, well, I, I don't know that that, that was really uh, taught, as far as we, we know, in the, in the theosophical tradition. Whenever Blavatsky talked about the hierarchies, or most of the hierarchies, she was pretty vague. There is the idea with some of them, the Asuras, for example, they are related to, to the Makaras, and the Makaras are related, I think, to Capricorn. And there are a, a few that we could try to figure out, but um, Blavatsky didn't develop that. So you don't know which five are no longer active? We don't even have no the names, names of those. No names for them. Yeah. Okay. So it doesn't correlate with anything like the Aquarian age is past or the... No, well, it, it probably has to do with that in a certain way, because even though they are not actively involved in the evolution, their influence is still there. And uh, it is said, for example, that this helping of the, um, the acquirement of the mind happened when there was a certain planet which, whose influence was active on Earth. 
because these hierarchies were related to that planet in particular. So it's probably a very complex system, but Blavatsky didn't course. talk m much about that. Okay. And uh, she used to say that all this information, you know, to have some of it may be useful for several reasons. Now, to have all the details would be useful for us at this particular level. She says the, the, the real information and complete information of all this is given during initiation because then that information is helpful for the role that the person begins to have in, in the world and in the evolution once the, the person is initiated. Okay, and you might be getting to this second question, but um, Catherine asks, uh, could the monad become conscious in the physical planes as the person develops? Obviously a very advanced soul, I mean, or would that be called illumination? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the complete fulfillment of that is the illumination, and that is the aim of, of human evolutions, that the monad can be self-aware on all the planes, and we are going to explore that a little bit more after this part. Okay. Any other questions? All right, carry on. All right, so now moving on from the hierarchies, let us see what happens to the human monad in this journey. When the Theosophical Literature describes Atman. It is described as something that is beyond consciousness, beyond what we understand as consciousness. That is because to be conscious of something implies a duality. You know, I am conscious of something that is outside myself. Therefore, there is this duality between the observer and the observed. So Atman, the state of consciousness, if we want to call it like that, of Atman, is unknown to us and it's beyond what we know as consciousness or unconsciousness. So sometimes Blavatsky would say it's um, conscious uh, non-consciousness. You know, uh, this is very frequent to, to talk in paradoxes. Um, yes, Ed has a comment. So I have a slightly different view. Uh, Atman is that which is aware of becoming conscious and unconscious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the, basically the Vedantic view uh, Blavatsky always said there is like this view in Buddhism, they tend to, they tend to talk about um, conscious, uh, about the, talk about the ultimate reality as emptiness, voidness. And in Vedanta, they, they tend to talk about the ultimate reality as the source of uh, consciousness or awareness. And uh, Blavatsky said, well, both views are are right from a certain point of view. And, but she said, in the theosophical approach, w since both views are, they, they have the defect of, of mm, making people think that the ultimate reality is either what we understand as annihilation or what we understand as consciousness. She says, it's really something that is beyond both or includes both. So these are just words so of so yeah. The writer would say it's prior mm -hmm. to both. Yeah, but it's but it's still knowable. Yeah, but Blavatsky says it's, it, it's knowable, but when you know it, you see that it wasn't ne neither what you call consciousness nor unconsciousness. So that's why she said it's conscious non-consciousness. Um, then we have Bodhi. Buddhi is the seed of, how to say, well, let's say universal, um, unitive, let's say, consciousness. That means 
it's a, it's a consciousness that is absolutely impersonal. It's a consciousness of oneness with no reference to any particular person, entity, or, or any particular separation. So it is just like the seed of consciousness. Now, the monad, Anma Bodhi, is not, therefore, is not conscious because it's just this universal consciousness with no separation. When the monad begins to go deeper and deeper into matter and finally reaches a human being, what happens is that it connects with the third principle, which is manas. And manas is the source of self-consciousness. You know, there is a difference between consciousness and self-consciousness. We, I think we discussed this before. Um, anim or plants are conscious of their environment. You know, the sun is there and they will tend to go to the sun. Now, are they self-conscious? Are they conscious of themselves as an entity? Well, the idea is that they are not. Uh, people who can perceive they are they are consciousness, they say that there is no self-consciousness. The same with animals, except in the higher animals, there, there is the, this incipient self-consciousness. So some of them are very close to develop it. But animals are also much more aware of the environment than plants, but they are not self-conscious because animals don't have manas activated. You know, plants and animals are, and minerals are on the physical and astral plane. It is only in human beings where manas is awakened that we acquire this self-consciousness. The original self-consciousness is a pure sense of being, of existing. Now, when manas animates the, a particular body and a particular set of emotions, this self-consciousness becomes a selfish self-consciousness or self-centered self-consciousness. Now, the, the pure self-consciousness was I am, I exist, with no, no delimitation of what is I. But now when, when Manas is working through our body, we say, I am this particular body. I am Pablo, and I am different from the rest. So the, the lower principles in the human being are uh, Kama, which is the, the more passional nature. Animals have this, this in them. And then we have the vitality, which is prana, then the vehicle of that vitality to the, to the body, which is the etheric double, and then the physical body. So the point is that the monad begins by being unaware of anything. And when it goes to the human stage and is connected to manas, it begins to develop self-consciousness. Now, this self-consciousness at the beginning becomes very selfish and self-centered. And uh, the aim of the spiritual life is to begin to, the, to spiritualize this self-consciousness. Because although the monad is connected to manas, it cannot really absorb that self-consciousness. That self-consciousness is too, too dense to be absorbed by the monad. So the idea is that you know, if you think in terms of manas, the part of manas that is more active at the beginning of evolution is the one that is more personal, that is related to, to the personality, to the passions, because that is the first thing that, that begins to develop in the process of human evolution. But little by little, this manas begins to be refined. This sense of self-consciousness begins to be more spiritual. And the monad begins to absorb, so to say, manas. So the monad that begins here as being Atma Bodhi, and sometimes it's called the dual monad, at the beginning of the evolution. At the end, it's called the triple monad, because it becomes 
Atma Buddhi Manas. That means, since Manas is the consciousness of all these planes, when the monad absorbs Manas, then the monad becomes self-conscious on all the planes. And when that happens, we have what we call an enlightened being. Notice that I don't, uh, we, we are going to explore this more in detail in the, the next talk, but Atman is always beyond. Atman doesn't change during the whole process of evolution. What changes is the vehicle of Atman, which is Buddhi. At the beginning, Buddhi is just an inert vehicle of Atman, and at the end of evolution, it begins to embrace manas. And this principle that is sometimes called Buddhi manas is that divine cells of divine sense of uh, being, which is beyond any selfishness or separation. So you have an enlightened being which knows that he's one with everything, but he knows it. That there is a, 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 an awareness that he is one with everything. So that is what is gained by the monad at the end of evolution. We are going to see in the next talk the more practical aspect what this implies and how to, to, to try to spiritualize our sense of self-consciousness. And uh, you've talked about this, you're talking about this on a um, universal humanity level. This can also be explained as far as like Manas waking up to more selfish in the teenager and explain it in this, our lifetime, this lifetime. Could you go through that? what I want you to do. Yeah, yeah, you can, you know, all the different stages repeat on different levels. So if you want to compare the whole journey of the monad with the different stages during a human life, you could say that at the beginning, when the monad is unconscious of the environment, it could be from the fetus state to the, the beginning to be a baby and then a, a kid up to six, seven years old when the, the kid begin, begins to recognize himself as, as a kid. So we could say that the first se six or seven years, depending on, on the person, it's more or less the journey of the monad up to the level of human beings. Now, when that kid is growing, Little by little, his sense of, at the beginning, his sense of uh, individuality is very feeble. They do whatever their parents say, and, you know, but as they grow, that sense of individuality becomes stronger and stronger. Now, along with that is the awakening of the emotions. So the sense of individuality becomes quite selfish, and, and you know, it can become aggressive. And that is exactly what, what happens with human evolution. At the beginning, in the third root race, the, the humanity is more like, like kids. Then in the fourth root race, it becomes really passional and aggressive and violent, and there is a lot of struggle. In the fifth root race, is like... The fourth is more like the teenage years. Yeah, the, the fourth is like the teenage. Years. And then the fifth root race is more like the young adult where the mind begins to more or less control the emotions. And the sixth and seventh should be the, the stages where the person is more mature and calm, especially in a, in a mature person. Some people don't pass, you know, the, the teenage years, even if they are older. <laughs> but yeah, we could, we could compare it with that. All right, I have a question. Um, is the eye of Raja Yoga leading towards Atma Buddhi Manas? The eye? In quotation marks. The eye in Raja, because well, there's no eye in Raja Yoga, the words. Yeah. Well, yes, the idea is that all these different paths are, are tending to produce exactly the same. They are trying to purify the, the sense of highness so that it can be absorbed by the monad. Now, how you do it is different. So you have 
the, the Raja Yoga is usually, as I said, thought to be a method that belongs to the first ray, a method of control and willpower. Uh, then traditions like, um, for example, Vedanta are more based on developing the perception of what is true, more based on wisdom, that is the second ray. Then you have some traditions that are more devotional, mm, like Christianity is very devotional, for example, and that is said to belong more to the kind of the, the sixth uh, ray. And, you know, through devotion, you can give up your, your personal self, and in giving up your personal self, you are purifying it. So you can also get the, the mystical experience of the Christians, for example, the mystics. Uh, they, they give up their lower self and then they are one with God, which is the monad. So um, all these different traditions, they tend to do the same, but through different means. Is there any other question or comment? Okay, so in the next talk, we are going to explore more a, a practical approach to this process, and we will discuss some of the different methods that, that we can employ to fulfill the aim of human evolution. Um, yeah. Since we have time, could mm -hmm. you yes Sorry. could you go over the seven rays a little more okay um, there are different approaches to this Blavatsky when talking about the seven rays she talked about these seven primordial beings the Dhyani Buddhas and she said that it is the the monads are like the cells so to say of each of these different Dhyani Buddhas. Remember that in the idea of the, the celestial beings is that a being includes a series of other entities within its consciousness. So a group of monads would be within the consciousness of a particular Dhyani Buddha. Then Subaru, for example, at the time of, that he was a contemporary of Blavatsky, he also said, it's really difficult to determine to what ray a monad belongs by looking at the external characteristics of a, of a person. You know, a person may, even if there is a person that has a lot of willpower, you cannot say because of that that the monad belongs to the first ray, for example. Now, later on, this concept of the, the, the seven rays was applied in in different ways or to different aspects of the, the cosmos. So Ernest Wood and Led Beater, for example, they would say there are religions that belong to different race. Well, actually, Subaru also said that. There are crystals that belong to the different race. There are people and methods. Hmm? Yeah, probably, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and then later on, uh, Geoffrey Hudson also developed these seven rays as how they express through human beings. So, yeah, usually it is said, you know, the first ray has to do with will, willpower, the second ray with uh, wisdom, the third ray is more like uh, scientific, the, the lower mind, the fourth ray uh, artistic. The fifth ray is similar to the, the scientific, it's also a, an intellectual ray. The sixth is devotional, and the seventh is more ceremonial. Okay. Okay, thanks. Um, Marina asks, uh, and she um, has a disclaimer. She knows she keeps asking this in different ways, but what is the benefit for the monad of this process of human experience and spiritual development? Well, depend, depending on what, at what level you want to answer the, the question, um, the monad... The, the benefit of the monad is the difference that there is between a baby and an enlightened being. The, I, I 
use this example frequently. You, the state of consciousness of a baby is a state of undeveloped unity. The state of consciousness of an enlightened being is a fully developed unity. So there is a huge difference if, if you see it at that level from a, a person, a, an adult that retains a state of consciousness like the, like the baby, we say that it's a person that is mentally retarded. Uh, so you have that on one side, that state of, con of consciousness may be in the unity, but it is completely unconscious. And next to it, you have an enlightened being. So that's the, what it gains.